Welcome back, Flyers Nitty Gritty fans, to Getting Gritty With It with your host, Dory Wallach, my partner in crime as always, Vasily Giannarakos, my friend. How are you? I'm doing good, Yareev. Uh, obviously, the Flyers not doing so hot uh, just with the eight-game winless streak um, and kind of all that's occurred here. I, I think really it's just crazy to see a team that showed so much resilience throughout the season uh, potentially end maybe here on, a, on a le- an 11-game losing streak and not really fighting back and, and bouncing back. I think that's where I'm the most shocked here just based off the season uh, and how the team's kind of reacted in these circumstances in the past. But uh, you know we're we're gonna get into it. We have a great guest uh, this week to break it all down with us. So I'm excited, you know, for the episode despite the negativity that might come out of it. But uh, how you doing, Yareev? I'm doing well, buddy. Thank you. Um, yeah, I feel you. Um, yeah, until welcome to the show, returning guest. You all should know who he is. We're all fans. We all listen to your podcast, Jason Martinez. Welcome to the show. How you doing? Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, I wish it was under you know different circumstances yeah. as well. Um, but this is the hand, I guess, that we're dealt right now. And, uh, the team is clearly, uh, it reeling would be, I guess, an understatement, but, um, yeah, they're struggling right now. And it's, it is kind of crazy that they're a team that played, you know, 60 games, 65 games at a really high level, but right now can't, can't find the satisfaction in their game at all. Yeah. I think that's, yeah, it's putting it even somewhat mildly after the, the last game, but I totally feel you. Um, especially those who listen to this podcast, they know kind of what we've been saying. And uh, I think the last game was a bit of a shocker. It took everybody back a little bit. Um, before we get started, I just want to remind everybody, please like, subscribe, hit the bell, uh, notification bell for notifications. Follow us on iTunes and Spotify. Uh, and give us a rating there if you can. That's a humongous help. Uh, and also a shout out to our sponsors, Jim Steaks at 4th and South. Make sure to get yourself a cheesesteak. They open up on May 1st um, or reopen up. Uh, and Summit Public Adjusters, you can reach them at 215-752-0560. Okay, let's get into it. So we we're talking about it already. Jason, I'll go to you uh, pretty much first on all of this because we've got a little bit of a time constraint, so we'll try to get everything in. Um, so the Flyers, you know, they still had some hope left. There were four games remaining in the season. They weren't mathematically eliminated. Technically, they're still not mathematically eliminated, though they're right at the the line there right now. Uh, they lose to the Canadians 9-3 in just a shellacking um, where they really kind of lost the game completely over a four-minute period in the second period. Um, but it was really brutal to watch. Um, I think everybody watching it probably hit them wrong, brought back flashes of what we saw prior to Tortorella, something we thought we just left in the past at this point, right? This team has been incredibly consistent. We've called them relentless over and over again, and we just did not see that. We haven't seen that over the, uh, really since they kind of finished that seven game gauntlet. Um, we've kind of seen the team, you know, fall into quicksand, as I've been saying, and just slowly, you know, trying to churn their way out of it, but just not getting saves, not able to score on their opportunities. Um, it's been brutal to watch. Jason, as you've been kind of watching this, you know, what's been going through your mind, especially, you know, during last game, um, you know, what's kind of your, your reaction? I mean, it's looking at it, it's kind of like this confluence of a, a team that either can't hit the net or can't miss the opposition goalie and that can't get their goalie between the puck and the back of the net. And that's why you see, I, you know, some of these really lopsided results. And it's, you, I didn't see it coming because this is a team that kind of answered the bell at several different inflection points throughout the season. You know, their first inflection point in the year came pretty early, you know, when they had that loss against San Jose. That was early in the year. San Jose had not won a game yet. Flyers, you know, lost to the Kings at home, got beat up pretty good, 5 nothing, And then they went on that road trip, and, and San Jose got their first win. I think it was their 12th game, if I recall. And that was an early inflection point for the season, and then they answered. And they rattled off five straight wins and, you know, really kind of pulled the nose up. Then they had a couple other, you know, dr- kind of droughts in the season, but they kept answering the bell and they would get back up. And I kept kind of referring to it on Flyers Daily that anytime there was a hiccup in the season, you know, we had the the dirt and shovel crew, the crew that stands there with a, the dirt and the shovel just waiting for you to have a stumble so they can pour dirt on your grave. Sure. But the team kept answering it and would come back and 
win five out of six or six out of eight or something like that. And they showed a lot of resilience and there was a lot of belief. And and then all of a sudden you see this happen. And really the shocking part about this is the, the opponents since the gauntlet. I mean, you're not talking about teams that should be beating you up and or beating you, let alone beating you up pretty significantly. I mean, you look at the teams, it's Montreal twice, Chicago. I mean, Chicago came in and beat the Flyers up 5-1. to one. Um, I mean, the Islanders are kind of a, a bubble team, but, I mean, Buffalo, I guess, playing a little better lately, uh, and and Columbus to get six goals from D-men, then obviously what happened in Montreal. Just didn't see it coming. And, you know, we've heard a lot about the room and how they've gotten that straight, but, you know, this calls a lot of things into question. You know, where is the room in this situation? Is this just the cumulative effect of playing way over your head all season and having some attrition with injuries? And then obviously the trade of Sean Walker and the loss of Carter Hart. It Did it all catch up and did it catch up to this degree? I think there's a really interesting element of this of how does this affect the evaluation process at the end of the year? Because there's always going to be an evaluation. If the team ran out of gas and, you know, they – they lost to Columbus because they were on a back-to-back, but one in Buffalo, and they lost four to two. And then, you know, they lost. They got goalied against the Canadians and lost three two. It would be different, but we can't ignore the fact that they've gotten belted in these five games. They've scored twelve goals and given up thirty two. I mean, it is incredible. So I didn't see it coming. Um, wish it hadn't come, but here we are. Yeah, well said, Vasily. What? what anything you want to add to that? Yeah, just to jump off, Jason, I think um, for fans and just for anybody really following the team, I could understand the frustration level um, just because you look at a team that hasn't really played in this manner, you know, where we're seeing them collapse um, or, you know, lose in a manner where it's by multiple goals. Uh really at any other point this season up until this stretch. Right. Uh, so I think that's where it's a little puzzling because it does look like, uh, the way they collapsed here, you know, it's an Elaine Vign- Vigneault era team in a sense, just because typically they've been a team all season that, like you said, Jason, has really just bounced back, showed a lot of resilience at multiple different points, right? Even dealing with the Cutter Gauthier trade, Carter Hart situation um you know the trading of sean walker even you know subtracting him from the defense they still didn't look you know too terrible over that seven game gauntlet so i think just the frustration for fans probably comes out of that that you know it's not really something that most probably expected um but nonetheless we're here right and if you look at the eight game winless streak flyers score 18 goals uh over that whole streak and allow 42 Uh, And I think there's really multiple factors to point to, um, right? Like, and that probably sets into frustration for the team as well. And and it might lead to other breakdowns, things like that. So for example, um, if you're a team only scoring, you know, 18 goals over an eight game stretch and you're creating as many high danger opportunities that they did create, which was a lot of them. uh, I think really the team gets frustrated from an offensive standpoint. And then you see some of the process start to slip in other areas, right? Like your defensive game, uh, you're trying to cheat a little bit, maybe to score some more goals due to the frustration. Uh, and then the defensive game kind of gets lost in the shuffle. And we, we see some missed coverages like we kind of witnessed right in the Columbus game in the Montreal game. And then it, kind of all really comes undone from there. Um, Obviously they've looked out of sync over this last period, uh, but just multiple factors, I think at play, right. Whether it comes from the defensive woes, um, the offensive woes, not really being able to being able to finish and a lot of the chances created goaltending as well. Um, So wrap that all together. And then you can add in even, you know, power play, being pretty bad for, you know, a whole season. And it's not even something you can really look to and rely on during the stretch to help you kind of get out of the funk too. So I think you factor all those things in and this is kind of, you know, culminated to the streak that they're at at this point. Um, what's your thoughts here, Eve, on that? Yeah. yeah. Go, go well, ahead, real quick on that. Um, because, Please. you know, the, there's a couple of things that are like bizarre about it. Like you mentioned those defensive breakdowns, like when Mark Stahl against Buffalo jumps to the middle to – jam up Alex Tuck after he drops the puck off and is kind of on the left side. Stall's playing the right or the left side. 
and you have Eric Johnson there and you have wing high support, there's just no reason. You're so redundant in your coverage on the guy that just got rid of the puck. And then Tage Thompson goes right down, guess where? The right side, the yeah. left side of the ice for the Flyers. <laughs> where you're not and, covering. Exactly. Where you're now, you're not covering. It, it, and it defies logic. And, you know, the re- redundancy in coverage is it's just one of those things. You're not thinking the game right. Um, and then the other part of it is this. You, you know, like they poured on. If you looked at the scoring chance map from the Montreal game, the 9-3 loss. They, and I didn't lot, tell you who yeah. won. I, you'd look at it and go, oh, the Flyers won this game. Probably 5-2. Something like that. I mean, they poured a ton of and high danger chances from in tight. You know, they got inside and got to the house, um, just couldn't score. And then you look at the other end. I mean, they're they've had some glorious breakdowns defensively, um, but overall, there hasn't been a ton of those. It's just, I mean, he, Brian Smith sent this to me last night. Um, they've held opponents to twenty four shots per game, uh, which is the second fewest in the league. Um, and have allowed 42 goals over that period, over this eight-game stretch, uh, which is 11 more than any other team. And their save percentage, team save percentage in the eight games is 781. Yeah. Like, you can look like a beer league numbers, and they're high. I guarantee if you find my beer league numbers, they are higher than 781. (laughs) So, I mean, that's just, that's bananas. Like, you've got to get saves, and they can't. And I think... I think a team plays so different in front of a goalie that's not giving them saves than one that is and the, sure. and the risk you're willing to incur, which is why yeah. I thought they were successful in the beginning of the year because they weren't afraid to trade rush opportunities with an opposition because the, the goaltending was so strong at that time. Now you see very little off the rush with this team. Um, part of that's personnel. Part of that is also that I don't think that they're leaking, but they are collapsing so low in the defensive zone to protect the house that they're leaving the high point guy wide open. And you saw Columbus feast on that shots from the point and so much traffic around the net. Some of it, their own is causing the goalies problems and the goalies got to fight around screens. And I, I say it's hard to stop when you can't see it, but damn it, you got to fight to say it. You yeah. got to find it in the NHL. You've got to find a way to get a look at the puck at release. And there's been too much of that not happening. No, I totally agree, Jason. I, I think really, if you look at, um, the frustration setting in from, you know, not being able to score on all those chances and you culminate, uh, you know, the fact that they're not getting a lot of saves and you're a team now kind of playing in a manner where you're not afraid to make a mistake, but you almost are in the sense that you think everything's going to end up in the back of your net. You're just not playing that same style that you were earlier due to due to those things, the frustration and the fact that, hey, they, they just think everything's going to go in and they look completely different, obviously. Yeah, I mean, no doubt. Yeah. yeah, it's it's one of those things that I think we saw under Hackstall a lot. And this was one of my critic. Jason, you wouldn't know this, but Vasily would. But this was one of my criticisms of Hackstall. It actually wasn't really the beginning of his performance. I thought he actually did a pretty admirable job when he started. But as things kind of got worse and worse in Philly, he started coaching kind of. And this Tortorella was caught in this in overtime a couple times, right? Like coaching not to lose. Um Jeez. It, and I feel like that's kind of what, you know, to your point with the goaltending and all that. And I think because of that, the team has just lost focus, right? Like they're making mistakes that they normally wouldn't have made throughout the year because they are so worried about giving up a goal or having breakdowns or not getting the save or not scoring the goal that it kind of changed their game. Like they're, they're not being as aggressive in the offensive zone. Like you can say that they are, but a lot of it is perimeter play. I'm pretty sure I heard you talk about this as well, is that they're sticking to the outside a lot. You know, they're not attacking the net in the same degree that they were. They're not just taking a shot from anywhere. They, they're they overpassing. And it, I think this is slowly but surely gotten worse to the point that they hit rock bottom, right? Like you saw signs of this uh, pretty much after the gauntlet or even a little bit during the gauntlet, even though I think they played reasonably well, especially against the tougher teams. But it seemed to just kind of trend into that where I don't know if they thought those games were so important to win or what, whatever came into the mindset, but their game drastically changed over the past several games. Like they are not like you can like while they're getting opportunities and all that, they are not doing it with the same level of aggression. And look, there are probably injuries. All of that stuff is probably included but, you know, I think all of that kind of culminated into them kind of collapsing, like you said. 
their game, not only do they collapse around the net, but they they collapse mentally where we're seeing them make mistakes. Like we brought up Vasily and I before you joined, we we're talking about Jamie Drysdale, who was minus six, and Nick Sealer was minus five. It was very uncharacteristic of Nick Sealer. He got beat on a play that I have not seen him getting beat like that this year where he got Josh shrugged Anderson. off. Yeah, yeah. You, you haven't really seen that stuff this year. And it kind of, I, I think this loss is kind of making everything seem worse, but it's kind of uncharacteristic. And this is like the one thing, it's like, I don't know exactly what all of these problems are, but I still, like, while I take it seriously, I have a hard time ignoring everything that this team has done well for this sample size in a very crucial time that's super public, and I get why everybody's pissed. But it doesn't seem like the same team. Like it's hard for me to say that this nine three loss, even the seven nothing loss, and all is like something we are going to experience over and over again. This is a pretty young team, and I think they. This is why we wanted them in the playoffs, right? We wanted them to feel what this is like, and I use that term quicksand because. It's so easy to fall into that, especially in the playoffs. I know you've been watching this forever. How often do you see a team give up a goal, then another goal, then then all of a sudden everything collapses on them in the playoffs because there's almost no room for error in the playoffs. And I feel like they are getting a taste of that right now. Um, so when when you list everything, you know, obviously the Sean Walker is gone. The power play has constantly been an issue, but I definitely think it's caught up to them. The penalty kill has not been as strong. Not having Carter Hart around anymore. You know, uh, I guess the the injuries that are, these guys are probably more injured than, you know, they let on. What do you kind of point to, Jason, as far as, do you kind of look at it as each one of these things is like 10% and you add them together and that's 100% of the problem? Do you see it as kind of a multifaceted issue or do you try to point to one or two things that really hampered the team i know like kind of the easy thing to do is to blame it on one thing like the, sure. the kind of the the blame du jour is the coach lost the team and they've quit on them I, which i think is bullshit um because talk about that I, I don't think pro athletes quit <laughs> yeah. you know yeah. i just I don't and if they do and you have a strong sense that they did bye-bye see you just later like Tord said yep That's yeah good. i mean look guys like that when they play you in ping pong they want to take your heart and put it on a stake right like when they anything they when they play cards or they anything they do that has a competition element they don't quit and as long i've always said as long as they plug in the scoreboard those guys are willing to do whatever it takes to win i, I don't think that they've quit i don't think that they're not working hard they're just playing horribly <laughs> um so i know people want to boil it down to one thing but it's not it's that's that's too convenient it, it's a lot of what you said and and more, I think. I, I think there are some guys banged up, and I think there's a lot of guys tired. But look, it's April, and it's an 82-game season. That comes with the turf. Um, you know, playing through that stuff and playing through being tired is you don't get bonus points. That That's part of the gig. Um, and then, you know, yeah, injuries, you know, for, for guys like, you know, missing Ristolainen, for example – who's been out for a while and, and playing 14 different D-men this year, obviously not ideal. Your depth chart doesn't go 14 deep. Um, but, you know, you look at some of the lineup decisions people want to point to, you know, playing, you know, Atkinson at times over Brink. But then you see Brink like that goal last night and that play that he makes. Like, I mean, to me, that's a guy that shouldn't be learning in the NHL. <laughs> that's You need to learn in the AHL that if you do that and you put it on tape, I am going to sit your ass down because I mean, that was pathetic. Like that was a horrible looking play. He's had a few of those this year for sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. He's had his fair share and, and maybe he'll learn. Maybe he won't. I don't know. Um, I, I know he's a good offensive player, but there's a, a lot that needs to be learned there about uh, work ethic and game shift management and all of that. Um, so you can't just, you can't just pin it on one thing. I think you have to look at the collective thing, but the, the key for me again, is that evaluation is how do these lopsided scores at this time of year, you know, how do they fit into that evaluation? How do they affect the valuation, uh, the evaluation of this team? I think it's much easier and much more worthy to evaluate players when things are sideways, when things are horrible, than it is when things are great. When things are great, it's easy. You show up, everything's working, everybody's harmonious, but you need to know what it's like when you're evaluating competitors, when you're evaluating skills 
and all of that when things are really tight and when the shit really hits the fan. That's when you can evaluate, you know, the essence of the athlete. And that's a big part of what needs to take place this year. You know, so that's part of it as well. Not that you're glad to go through something like this, but you want to see how guys will react when you do go through something like this. Um, so that's part of the equation. I thought it was interesting in, after the game that the whole team was in their uniform and in the locker room when all the media came in after. I have to think that was a Sean Kateria thing. He said, no, you know what? Nobody's dodging this. We're all going to be here as a unified group when that media comes in. And we're going to answer for this embarrassing 9-3 loss. So I thought that that was, that was a character. Somebody on that team determined that. And I would imagine it would be him. Um, but yeah, you can't just point to one thing. It, it's it's a lot of things. And, you know, I, a lot of people go, well, Erson got overworked. And um, again, it's not like he's played 76 games. I, I think these are just... Like Tort says a lot of times, I think you can talk athletes into being tired, and I agree with that. Yeah. They're tired, there's no doubt. But and and Sam hasn't been sharp. I th I think his confidence is just gone. I see a goalie. What? It's so easy to spot a goalie with no confidence. He makes himself look so small. And Sam, at times, can make himself like when he was going good, he had the three shutouts and went twelve three and two or whatever it was over that seventeen game stretch. He looked like he was, you know. Andre the Giant, the way he'd come out on a shootout and challenge the shooter, like come out, show him his chest, and be like, and then flow back with him. Well, he's just sunk back in now. He looks small, his body language, everything. So yeah, I think you're seeing guys without confidence, but to, to point to just one thing is impossible. Yeah. It's a culmination of of all of these things. You don't lose to Montreal nine to three because of one element. It's it's a total team. Uh, that's got no confidence. Their game is lost, and and right now they're kind of drifting without you know without a sail. I th I think what you said about Arison is actually probably a hundred percent spot on. You know, it's hard to be a hundred percent, but it and it also sounds like that attitude that he had. That's the exact same thing that the Flyers' as the team is going through, right? Like where they were attacking areas, they're kind of they're losing board battles and then kind of collapsing really quickly. And not getting the puck out in the same uh, with the same like gusto, like look, Sean Walker. Well, they just flip it. All they do is flip it now. Sean Walker no transition game. Yeah, well, Sean Walker is a huge part of this team. Was a huge part of this team. I I agree. He had a great season. He also wasn't far and away the best defender on the team. It shouldn't have completely disappeared, right? Like it's not like he left and then every transition turned bad. That doesn't yeah. make sense to me. There yeah, should be a Bobby loss. Ward. Right, exactly. I'm not gonna like. There are people who thought he was garbage before the. And we said otherwise. Vasily was on it from day one, you know. But it's not enough for everything, right? Like it's kind of. I think it's just slowly degraded because they weren't playing very well over. I mean, let's just say the last thirty percent of the season, yeah. it was not the same team for the previous seventy percent. Vasily, go ahead. Do you want to? I think their confidence has just been degraded, right? And that's in a lot of different areas, but. I mean, you kind of summed it up perfectly, Jason. It's not just one thing. It's a multitude of different factors um, that have, you know, impacted the team in this way and have kind of caused them to go down this route with the with the eight game winless streak. Like for me, um, at least, I mean, the goaltending is a big one because if you can't get, a, you know, a consistent save, I don't care what team you are. It's it's going to be a tough one, um, obviously. Mm -hmm. But like but like you said, Jason, you know, there's how many other goalies in the league that have played more games than Urson at this point? Like obviously. For him, I, th I think the tough part is he's a rookie, so they were never looking to give him this much work in general. Um, but just for him and for the rest of the team, I think a lot of it has to do with confidence. Like you said with Urson, a confident goalie's coming out, cutting the angle down, um, being efficient in that manner. And that's essentially not all but gone, but you know, once things start to go bad, you can kind of see him reverting and getting into that shell deep in his net. Like uh, for me personally, I think he didn't even play very uh, bad last game. Like it was one nothing, maybe up until 11 minutes left in the second period. And then once the one goes in and the team kind of collapses and, you know, leaves some guys open back door, then it all kind of dwindles from that point. Um, but just like it's confidence first, and I think it's confidence for the defense and the way they move the puck up ice and for the forwards and the way, you know, they've they've been unable to finish like 
the thing that made this team so successful throughout the year um, is the rush offense, transition offense. Like you pointed to, Jason, where has that been, right? Over the last eight games, they've kind of been flipping the puck up, not really making those quick exits out of their zone, quick passes up ice. And I think as that has slowly diminished, you know, over the last couple of weeks, what whatever it may be that caused it, that's kind of what we've seen the team um you know, diminish as well, right? In their performances and their results. Um, you see yeah. their style of play not able to be executed efficiently. And they're kind of not playing pond hockey, but they're not, you know, going back to that base style. They're kind of all over the place in a sense. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, you, I always look for the cause and effect. Like every goal that they score, every goal that gets scored, I go, okay. The, the, the results, the goal, why did it happen? And the cause and effect of not being a team that can play in transition like they did earlier in the year, which was, I mean, they were third in the league in transition um, uh, chances. They were first and rush chances. The, yeah, they were fourth. I mean, this is 60 games in. They were fourth in the league in transition goals. I mean, this is a team that I could count on easily one hand last year that scored transition goals. You know, I mean, they've set a record in the NHL this season for penalty shot goals because they played so fast in transition. But the effect of not being able to execute that anymore is what? Defending less or defending way more when you can't do it. So there's they get hemmed in so much easier now and they don't exit with possession. Because if you get out in transition, you're at least obtaining the offensive zone and obtaining it below the top of the circle. So that's number one. That that's that's a, a failure in transition offense, but that's the worst case scenario. So getting in below the top of the circle with possession. So now the other team's got to go 180, 200 feet. So the fact that they're unable to do that has shortened the ice so significantly for the other team to 160 feet that they can now transition on you before you're even in your structure, which is is well, why seen, you yeah. high transition hockey <laughs> is, is simply to catch them not able to get into their structure so that you're causing decisions all over the ice that aren't structure based because there's going to be mistakes and it's a game of mistakes. So that's been to me the biggest thing. And yeah, Sean Walker was good in transition, but so was Travis Anheim. So was Cam York. Um, so were other players that, that played on the team this year. But um, when you, you lose confidence as a group, um, those types of things are the first to go because they're confident plays. They're really mm -hmm. decisive, instinctual plays. It was a game early in the year when I first started like kind of picking up like something's different from last year to this year. Because last year, they were the king of the D2D -D regroup and your typical regroup cycle in the neutral zone, D2D -D pass, and you're running, the guys are running clock, like the whole thing. I've coached it a thousand times. It's as, as nauseating as it gets. But you started seeing turnover in the neutral zone to a D. No way there was a D2D -D pass. It was right back up and, you know, stressing the opponent and kept seeing this over and over again. And I remember in my weekly session with Torts, I went in and I said, something's different here before we even started taping. I said, the way you guys are playing in transition is so different. And then we talked about it on the episode. And basically the thought was, we have to start playing this way because of some of the pieces we had coming at the time. It was Gauthier and Michkov, obviously, but we got to play faster. And it worked and they were great at it. But once, you know, some of the attrition happened and confidence went, your your ability to make those plays on instinct goes away. You start thinking. And there's no time to think in that league. Like, I mean, how many times do you see a D to D degree group with Ivan Provo? It's one of the reasons why he's not here. They didn't want to play the style that he played. Because it was very plodding and slow and not decisive. It was one of the problems that Tortorella had last year with and the beginning of this year with Zamula not quick enough to instinctually just go back up, to go for the D to D regroup in a safe way. And they didn't want to do that. But, um, you know, in transition last year, they needed so many things to go right to score goals. You needed to like a, a, a six point checklist of net front layered screen, rebound, all that stuff to score goals. Well, now you're getting offense off a of transition and all of a sudden you're a team that can score goals because you're scoring in multiple ways. And that's dried up as well. So that, that's, that's a huge part of where they are right now. It's funny that you just brought up Zamula as well, where I was like, oh, I didn't, I like forgot about him almost just because he was benched during the practice. And um, no, I think you're spot on there. Um, so I guess this brings up something you brought up earlier. And I, I'll just read a quick 
quote, and you you might have more information, Jason, just because you know you work for the organization, and whatnot. But uh, this is from Darren Drager on Twitter. Uh, we can all appreciate the speculation, and when it comes to John Tortorella and the stories that follow, there's always speculation. As for the future as a head coach, Flyers management source says Torts is not leaving the bench. Uh, he still has fire, no question about that. So, you know, I want to bring that up because there's all these rumors and it's not even rumors, speculation from people wide about how he's not going to be the coach of this team next year. He's not going to be fired, but he's going to be moved to management. And all because of this sample size. And I think it's very unfair to throw out everything that he has done well for this organization, everything that he was recognized for because they stumbled here at the finish line, which he was desperately trying to avoid and warning us about it publicly as well consistently like people are upset that he was harsh on people publicly and all that but you can see why he was trying to stop this from happening but probably because he's seen it before and maybe he had little hints that maybe it would happen just from their play and you know how he kind of was seeing them regress in certain areas you know what are your thoughts about Tortorella as far as you know obviously going into next season you know but kind of a reflection of what he's done as a coach you know over the season do you think that this end of the season here necessarily paints what Tortorella has done. You know, obviously maybe not Jack Adams worthy now just because they're not going to make the playoffs and all that. Um, and they did stumble here at the finish line. So maybe he doesn't deserve an award from the league. Um, but what do you, what is your evaluation kind of of Tortorella and uh, you know, how he's kind of pulled this team into what they are today? Well, I mean, obviously when it comes to torts, there's always, there's nobody ambivalent. There's a lot of people that love him and there's people that think he's a dinosaur and, you know, they kind of follow some of the, you know, false narratives about torts and they say, oh, he's too hard on players and he wears out his welcome real quick. And only the data doesn't support that. I mean, he's got two six year stints and a seven year right. stint prior. I mean, his average length of tenure is more than double what the average is in the NHL right now. Exactly. Um, but don't let the facts get in the way for, for those people. And, you know, they look at it now and they see the way he handled Couturier and, you know, naming a captain and then healthy scratching him. I, I think we're going to hear something about Couturier after the season that he's been obviously dealing with something and um, from an injury standpoint, and they'll never bring that up in season. Um, but when I look at, you know, the job he's done, I mean, there are some things that you can question, no doubt about it. Sure. You can look back at, you know, usage of uh, certain players or, you know, maybe did you use Couturier too much in the beginning of the year and, could that have been avoided? I don't know that it was. I mean, he looked like he could handle what he gave him at that point. And I don't know if you were thinking about the cumulative effect at that point. Maybe he should have. Um, and then, you know, you can look at usage of late, whether it's Eric Johnson or Mark Stahl over either Samula, Jinning, or or Adderd. Um, You can look at those things as well. Um, and, and those are certainly, you know, people are, can have their opinion on that. Um, the fact of the matter is, though, I, I mean, he's... I think Kevin King gave him crossing broad said it right. He said um, he's way closer to a Jack Adams than he is the unemployment line. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think he's going anywhere. Um, this is the way towards operates and everything that we hear publicly, there's no shock value in the locker room. They've all heard it already. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not like he goes there, says it, and then is, is walking around the locker room and glad handing people. It's not how he operates. No, he doesn't blindside his players. Exactly. No, he never does. And they always know where they stand and they may not agree with his assessment of the play, which is kind of what I got from what Couturier said when he was scratched that they may not see eye to eye on, you know, the evaluation of a certain players, you know, own kind of perception of his play. That's fine. Um, they're entitled to that. Um, but, but this notion that, in pro sports, that conflict is means divorce. It doesn't. <laughs> you know, if you've ever played any sport competitively, there's conflict with coach player. There's conflict with teammates. There's all of that. And it doesn't mean there has to be a divorce. If you get into one argument, you don't throw everything out. Um, you got to do your best to get on the same page and, and move forward. Um, but that, you know, the fact people are like, oh, my God, he criticized such I mean, what do they think these players are like a bunch of daisies, like lurking around the locker room? Like these guys have been criticized before. It's OK. It's not the end of the world. Um, but, you know, with t I, the other thing I, I really wonder, too, is when people say, well, Torts is going to go up to the front office. What the hell is he going to do? 
Who's what, what role <laughs> is he taking in the front office? They've already got <laughs> Danny Jonesy. They got three assistant GMs and Brent Flair to handles it. What is Torts going to do yeah, in the front coach, office? Right? Let, like, let's be real. Um, yeah. I mean, like, what are we even talking about? <laughs> you know? So, I mean, if, unless he just moved to an ambassador role, that's an, that's a really good payday for an ambassador type role just to be a figurehead. But no, I, I, I don't see it happening. Um, I think it's I think people are just frankly, they're just such pussies when it comes to hard coaches nowadays mm-hmm. that it drives me nuts. Yes, it really yeah, does. And I'm, a, I'm a bit old school, but I understand the modern athlete. But geez, like people are just they just want to be offended by the a coach speaking his mind. And it's like, come on, let's how about a little bit of scar tissue here. I can only like imagine calluses on your hand. I'll say I can only imagine what would have happened if Mike Keenan was coaching in this era. Some of the oh. news stories and <laughs> well, what it came out, they think Tortorella is bad, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, for Tortorella and his season, I think it's unfair to kind of judge everything that he's done just on this eight game sample, right? Like just look at the success and just look at the way the team was playing prior to these eight games, you know, how many top teams they they've defeated where in years past, they wouldn't have even, you know, been in competitive games. And just the fact that they've mainly been competitive of most of their games. And other than really this recent stretch where they've been losing handedly to some teams, they haven't really shown themselves to be a team that, you know, will get their doors blown off multiple times within a season other than this stretch here. Um, So I think the kind of discount and take away, you know, everything that he's done over the 70 games just for the last eight, that that would essentially be unfair to what he's done, Um, especially considering the fact that most thought this team would be a bottom five team anyway, right? Like if you look at them on paper, look at the talent level, look at kind of what, you know, NHL and just media pundits were predicting for the Flyers before the season began. um, They were essentially stating that they would finish in the bottom five of the league. And for a coach to, you know, have them on the door, you know, knocking on the playoffs and potentially make it, I think that would, that's a a success. If you look at it, at it, you know, overall and and as a whole, Um, but at least for, for Tortorella and, you know, what he's done and, and what, um, you know, he, I think, and the front office need to do moving forward, like the evaluation process will be interesting because you look at, you know, this eight game stretch, I'm sure there's certain veteran guys, certain players you would be concerned about because you want to see them respond and, and play better under the, the most crucial circumstances. Um, so I'm kind of interested to see what Briere and, and Jones think about that in terms of Tortorella and maybe not being able to get those players to respond in the eight game stretch. That's so crucial to try to make the playoffs. So I think that's maybe where the criticism comes. And I think Tortorella probably would say that himself, that maybe he didn't do a good enough job by getting the team to, you know, either buy back into their structure, buy back into their system, do whatever they needed to do to kind of get out of this funk, um, you know, over this eight games. And he has mentioned that, that, you know, he needs to prepare these guys better. He needs to get them, you know, back into playing the way they did before in some sort of manner, some sort of way. So that's probably something that we'll hear him speak about more um, in the season ending press conferences. But uh, I think, you know, he, he for with what he was given and, and this team, he's done a good job this season. Obviously, it's not the ending that you want, but I think he'll probably own up to that um, to end the year here in the press conferences. I, I Yeah, I agree. I think he will as well. I mean, if you like if you want to go back and go, OK, like these last eight games and there's a recency bias because they just happened. Exactly. Um, but if we want to, you know, if you want to point some things out, you know, if you want to go back, like, say, to. Um, you know, in November, I think it was, was it, no, it was in December and they win a fifth straight game and they win five to one over Dallas and held Dallas to two shots in the second period. Yeah. You know, beat Colorado beat, earlier as well. They beat, they won seven games this year when the opponent was the top um, points percentage team in the league. They beat Winnipeg twice. They beat Vancouver twice. Um, you, you beat the Vegas Golden Knights this year. You beat uh, Colorado, like that game in Colorado, they go into the third period up three, two. Do they just sit on it? No, they kept pushing. They won five, two right back in, uh, on the 9th of December, uh, they go into these games and, you know, you think, Oh, they're going to be outclassed in this game. They, they beat Florida twice in Florida in two, one games, you know? So there's a lot of wins in there that you go, there's no way they would win those games based on preseason expectations, but they went out there and they battled and got saves when they needed to. And, Played very smart, um, 
you know, situational hockey in those and, and, and came out with wins. So, um, I, look, I, I always say that, like people were saying a couple weeks ago, you know, oh, it would be better if this team, you know, during the gauntlet when they were struggling before even this skid post gauntlet, uh, you know, it, if they get into the playoffs, uh, they're just going to get in and get knocked out anyway. It just doesn't even make sense. And I said, look, I'm going to evaluate the team on all of it. If you earn your way after 82 games into the playoffs, you deserve to be in the playoffs. I don't care how it happens. It's 82 games because a game in October has the same points of value as one does in March and, and in April. And and just like the evaluation of John Farrell, it's going to be evaluated on everything, on the full 82. That's how I'll do my evaluation. And I'll do the same for players. And I'll have to try and shed the recency bias of the struggles here at the end, but also having those as part of the equation. Um, not only when they lost the games, but how they lost them. And you look at all of that, and that's how you should judge players on it on the year in total. Yep. You, you you take what happened beginning of the year, and it's got a certain amount of weight to it, and you weight it all, and you come up with your evaluation based on that. Um, not going to evaluate based on emotion right now, and you know being pissed off that they, they've lost eight straight and that they got their doors blown off in Montreal. Uh, but when the evaluation comes, like for Torts, and it'll be the same for every player for me, I, I'm going to look at it, all of it. Um, with the emotion removed. Well said, and I love what you said about people being pussies. I totally agree with you. It's something that I've definitely brought up on this podcast. That people are just not used to that type of coach anymore. I don't know why, because majority of coaches in the league behave the exact same way. I guess Torts is just more public about it, but it's exactly what this group needs, in my opinion. I think it's what every type A athlete really needs, is a guy that's pretty much in your face because he's going to be that way. So well, we got, think Torts is still old Torts, though, too, real quick. Um, no, he's he, evolved. He's evolved quite a bit. Yeah. Like, he, one of the things that he does a lot now is the team won't travel. Like, if they play on Tuesday night on the road, they won't travel Tuesday after the game. They'll stay overnight in the hotel and then travel. He'll, he'll waive the practice so that the players can sleep in the bed that night and then travel the next day and then play the game Thursday. He does a lot of things, like, kind of to help players in that regard yeah. as well. So yeah, he th he those takes, things are important. He takes recovery really seriously. And I'm pretty sure he evolved the league actually um, by his handling of that. Yeah. Um, so let's, uh, we have a few more minutes here. So let's uh, end it with one more question for you. So going into next season, what are your thoughts that, you know, what, if, if you just had to kind of name your top priorities right now, I know there's three games left, but assuming they don't make it, which, you know, they probably won't. They're not going to make it. Right, new. exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, what's kind of the top of your mind going into next season? What kind of changes, you know, would you expect the Flyers to make? Or maybe if you were in Danny Briere's position, like what are you kind of going into the offseason? What kind of mindset of changes or anything like that? Well, mindset, I'm going in because we're going into back into a rising cap world. So I, my opinion, and for a lot of people who express this, that this is going to get crazy again, where you're going to see players available that recently haven't been available because of the limited market for them because of the flat cap world. So I think you're going to see big names, you know, be able to be moved around the league. Um, so I got to look at all of that. I got to look at guys that can be a difference maker for me next year, three years and five years down the road whether that's a guy like Brady Kachuk or, you know, if he became, I don't know if he will be, but like that type is, is kind of where I'm, I'm eyes wide open on all of that. I'm not closed off to any of it. I'm not following this rigid, you know, path of a rebuild. This is already the third year of a rebuild. Like, let's just yeah. be honest here. It's Especially the when year. they pick Gautier, like, you know, in a top five situation, if you're picking top five, you're essentially rebuilding. So yeah. And they had two, and they had two, first round picks last year and they get Meech yeah. and Bonk. They have two this year and they have two next year. I don't, I'm not saying they're going to use all those picks this year or next year. I think you can use those if a player of that ilk of, a, of Brady Kachuk became available. I think you could then, you know, use that as organ because we know how valuable first round picks are. Oh my goodness. It's like bullion, um, according to some people. Um, but, and you have to draft in the top five. You'll never find a player um, draft in the top five. You're, you're speaking never. our language, Jason. I mean, Let's just Jesus. say it that way. I guess Pasternak went in the top five. Or right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess, you know. But anyway, um, 
I digress. Or Kucherov, uh, you know. Yeah, in the second Travis round or Konechny. point in the third round or connect me late in the first or, yeah. you know, whatever it is. Um, so I, I'm eyes wide open on all of that. But the key areas are obvious. I mean, you got to – you need a, another big centerman that can move. You need a little bit more power up front. You have some guys, whether that's, you know, Hathaway or those guys in, probably should be a fourth liner. But you need a big power player, a guy that plays around the blue paint that's a, a bear um, in your top six. Certainly, I mean, you'd like it in your top, on your top line, but in your top six um, because they are undersized up there. Yeah, um, great point. And, and if you trade Ristolainen, which I don't know that is out of the question, you got to make sure you still have some size on that back end as well because you do have some some bigger, like Sanheim's a big guy. He doesn't play big. He doesn't play a big heavy game. He's not a guy that will physically, you know, the other team will feel accountable in that regard. So I think you need some of that on a blue line for a team that's, going to take a next step so i look at those areas and then i'm really i got I have to look at goaltending and, and where are we going here um with airson do, do we evaluate him on this year on raw numbers probably not but you know what is the forecast on him is he a number one you know what about fedotov i mean fedotov is not i mean he's 27 his developmental years are in the rearview mirror can he now adjust to this game in the NHL, which is not easy. I mean, you see, I mean, the sheer size is great, but it comes with a lot of, you know, it, it almost like baggage in a way for a goalie. It's a lot to move. And you see his lateral movement um, leaves a lot to be desired right now. He needs to read the game better as a big guy. Uh, I mean, I see him every time he comes out of his crease, look down to see if he has his, you know, angle right. And he's doing that because he, he feels like he's playing on a football field because he's, he has no spatial awareness. He's used to playing in a huge rink and all of a sudden the spatial awareness and his like mental cues and everything are off because he's playing in a tight rink. So um, there's a lot to consider there. I mean, you're going nowhere without goaltending and Carter Hart ain't coming back through the door. I know that. So th that's how do you want to attack that position next year? You want probably call us off to play a year in the AHL. Are you going to go in next year with Erson and throw off and, you know, there's a little risk involved in that for me. Um, and I don't think the team's in a position to to kind of take a step backwards. They earned some equity back this year. Maybe they're giving a little bit of it back now um, for some people. But I think, I, I think most educated people understand that the organization is being stewarded correctly again um, and being, you know, from a philosophical standpoint, handled the right way. Um, so I don't think you can afford to take a step backwards in that regard in stature. So how I, I would assume Danny Breer is going to general manage the way he played, which is very aggressive, um, somewhat dirty <laughs> and, uh, effective on the big stage, you know, and I think he's going to have a chance to step onto the big stage this off season and, and mix some things up. And I think that he will. I think that's really well said. Uh, Jason, I know you're on time restriction, so uh, I'll let you go here. Um, we'll keep we'll keep going with our show. Um, but I think everything you said, you know, is pretty much spot on. You repeated a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about on here too. So it just shows that, you know, despite all the chaos online and on Twitter, which you know we all are huge fans of, um, you know, that there is a different consensus out there too with a, a different way of thinking. And I think that'll rise up more as we enter the off season and people kind of put these losses behind them. We can start speaking rationally a little bit. Um, Vasily, anything you want to say to Jason before he cuts out? No, just thanks for taking the time, Jason, to hop on. Like you said, I mean, we've been talking about what you're kind of been saying on this episode uh, all season. So it's, it's great to have a conversation with you. Awesome. Anytime boys. All thanks right. Thanks for having thank, me. Thank you, brother. Yeah, take care, Jason. Have a great night. Okay. So, Jason got his thoughts out as far as, you know, what the Flyers should do in the offseason. I think he's echoed, you know, kind of like we were saying to him, a lot of the little things that we would do. I'll open up to you first, Vasily. You know, what are your thoughts kind of heading into the offseason? You know, uh, is there anything specific you'd look to do? I think we're probably going to align a lot on this. But, you know, what are your kind of immediate thoughts? And we're a little early for this, but let's touch on it anyway. 
Yeah, I think it's something that's on everybody's mind, right? Like, what are the next steps for the team? Because obviously this season is essentially over at this point. I mean, there's three games left, but there's not really any meaning in these three games. I think um, the one thing maybe for the three games that would be a positive is to at least see them not, you know, lose 8 nothing for the remainder of the three or something, right? Like some sort of positive, uh, them actually competing again just to end it off. Um, that would be nice. But in, in terms of what, you know, the Flyers need and what's going to happen this offseason, I think Jason uh, made a great point that with the salary cap rising, I do firmly believe that there'll be a lot of players and a lot of players that you might not have thought would have been available in the past that will be available, right? Because teams are going to be a lot more flexible just with the money that they can bring in and the money they can even move out because other teams might be able to accommodate them or help them out in areas where they may not have been able to in the past due to cap restraints. So I think you're going to see a lot of... Um, Players maybe that are in that, you know, 24 to let's say 28 range that teams might not might be frustrated with for certain reasons, right? They're not producing how they think they should be, or, you know, they've been given certain opportunities, not risen to the occasion on those certain teams. They might be moved, right? Like a guy like a Trevor Zegers, for example, um, there might be, you know, other similar players in that age range. So I, I think for the Flyers, if you're going to target, you know, players that fit this rebuild and kind of that fit the next step of, of where this team is going. They do need to probably be in that, you know, 24 to 28 year old range and kind of fit the same age range that this group is in, because you don't want to go and adding like, you know, certain veterans that you would add to maybe a cup contender, for example. Right. Like I look at people online saying, Oh, Steven Samkos is a UFA. I don't think a guy like him fits the flyers timeline. Unfortunately, just where he is at in his career, would it be a great ad? And somebody that you'd want on your team for sure. But, you know, with where Stamkos is and where he's going, he's kind of on the back end of his career here. You probably wouldn't want to add a guy to a team that's looking to just start contend, uh, start, you know, they're, they're contending. Would, I don't think he would want to. to yeah, exactly. To Exactly. Right. So I think for the Flyers, you know, they're going to they're keep their options open, right? If a hockey trade makes sense where let's say they need to move a young player, they get another younger player that fills maybe a, a position of need, like for center, for example, that's probably something they'll explore. Um, I look at the wingers on this team, right? We've talked about it with Steve ad nauseum. How many wingers are in this system? I look at them to maybe move some of that wing depth to either add, you know, at center add on defense potentially i think the glaring hole and everybody kind of realizes it is their center depth as jason mentioned you probably would like to add a top line center if possible um sean couture might still be that like we saw how he played to begin the season but i think just with his age and the injury troubles he's had because it looks like you know once the season ends based on what jason was saying they'll probably reveal another injury that he's been kind of playing through all year I think it's safe to assume that he's probably going to be, as his team contends, a, a really good second line center, but not a guy that can carry your team, you know, to that cup at this point. So probably look to add somehow, you know, a top line center. I don't know if that's going to be this off season, but you have to see what opens up, right? Like what kind of players are available, what these teams might be wanting for that type of player in terms of draft capital assets you have. So, I mean, I think Briere if you look at the Gautier trade, right? Nobody expected that. I think he's a very active GM in the sense that he'll explore any opportunity if he thinks it will help the team get better. I think that Gautier trade's a great example. What What's happened with Ivan Fedotov is a great example that he's a guy that you know, is willing to look into and make, you know, difficult trades or multifaceted trades, multi, you know, team trades to try to get this team to be better, which is something that Chuck Fletcher didn't seem to, you know, be able to do or really get his hands into. Um, so center is the big one for me. And then uh, goaltending as well, though I'm confident in Urson, uh, I, I feel like you're a rookie goalie playing as much as he did under the circumstances he did. It's a real tough situation to be in. I think he'll bounce back and have a, a nice season next season. Fedotov, it's obviously hard to know, um, but I, I wouldn't be surprised to see them, you know, get a solidified backup, maybe like a Jake Allen, somebody of that ilk where, Hey, if Fedotov doesn't adjust the way we think um, there's somebody to rely on. Cause I, I do agree with Jason in the sense that it is a big risk going you know into next season with a goalie that's essentially a rookie in Fedotov 
in the NHL is not really used to the NHL gameplay and who knows how he'll adjust. And you're going in with a guy that's going to enter a sophomore season that just ended off, you know, his rookie season pretty brutally. So it would be a risk to go in with those two guys. So I would expect them to sign somebody on the goaltending front. Uh, what do you think you just for, you know, yeah, no, I, I think, I think everything you said is pretty astute. I, I imagine they might try to carry three goalies at the NHL level next year. Fedotov being one of them. Yeah, um, and try to go with that and then leave Peterson and uh, Kolosov with the AHL duties and try to bring in another probably older vet. And the one thing I think they will try to do, and I think they're going to pencil Sean Couturier as the top line center next year, assuming, look, I think they're going to go by the logic that that I have, that you have, that we have seen over and over again with players coming back from injury, that they really need an entire season to come back need a healthy off season. That's why it's so important that Sean Couturier and I tweeted out about this. I think people are underplaying how important it is that Coots was not out for the remainder of the year. Yeah. He was well, able that, to... that injury, sorry, you even looks super serious, right? So the fact right. that he avoided that is huge. Yeah. Cause he needs a whole off season to, to train, recoup, to heal up, to train. He needs to get back to where he was. Could there be an option to move out for a top line center? I think they'll absolutely explore it. But what I think they'll actually do is when we look at somebody like Ristolainen, unless they, you know, th I might be completely wrong about this and they might be like, no, Risto's just going to come back. But like he has a sizable contract, but it's nothing, especially when the cap goes up, that is excessive. And he's not an old man either, right? He's 30, right? So it's not like this like dying product. You know what you're going to get with Risto. You know, he's this big mammoth, you know, kind of defensive with some two way upside defenseman. And if teams are going to be moving money out, like somebody like Vegas, and I'm just throwing this out as an example, this is a best case scenario. I don't think it's going to happen, but it's something I would like to see. But you look at somebody like Alex Petrangelo, you know, they're up against the cap. They've added significant cap over this uh, trade deadline. They, they're going to need to move some money out. They have a bunch of good defensemen. Alex Petrangelo is old right by nhl standards right but he probably has a lot left in the tank and he would be our number one defenseman if you can find a guy like that who is paid a lot and will be paid a lot at the end of his career so a team might want to try to get out of his contract earlier and you can move risto plus right it's obviously not going to be a straight up swap though they do get a large cap saving on him you know if you could do a risto for petrangelo something like that i know that's idealistic and get a number, a, a legit top guy to add to Travis Sanheim being the other veteran. And then you can roll with Sealer on the bottom pairing where he's supposed to be. York be Drysdale's a pairing. York Drysdale, yeah. right? That, that's all I'm saying. Or maybe it's York and Petrangelo is a pairing. And it's, you know, uh, Drysdale and Sanheim. Or maybe Drysdale plays the bottom pairing next year. I don't know. Right. But you look at that and you look at the effect that somebody like Sean Walker had on this team. I think that would be in their best interest is to shore up the blue line. Right. It's the one thing you can control. And there are defensemen out there. Goaltenders, you know, Jake Allen's not a game changer. Um, Anthony Stolar is not a game changer. You know, n none of these. There'll goal be a lot of guys you can sign as a goal. Right. For sure. None of them are going to be better than Airson. Right. Despite Airson's collapse here at the end of the season, he will. He's a rookie. He will get back to where he is. he's a good goalie. He's a damn good goalie. So I think if you can shore up your D and make sure that these massive injuries and whatnot don't affect the team, maybe it, maybe Zamula is thrown into a trade. I, I don't know. I'm just throwing out ideas. But, you know, you try to go out there, and then you have these young defensemen still in the system with Adderd, with uh, Andrea, right? Like, you have other guys, maybe even Granz. I don't know how he's going to pan out. But you have other guys that can be thrown into the mix in a bottom pairing role if your top four is, is kind of like seared up. I love what Jason said about size in the top six. I think we do have Forrester. That's a good one, but he is also a rookie. There is a risk of a sophomore slump next year. I don't think the Flyers are just going to sit back and be like, we're going to be bad next year. No, like, we I didn't. Agree. We didn't see that this year. And well, I do. I do think there's a chance. And I'll let you come in here for a second. I do think there's a chance still that Scott Lawton gets moved. Um, in the off season, and maybe it's Scott Lawton and Rasmus Ristolainen for Pietrangelo or something like that. You know, where you kind of double up and you help fill the team's um, depth 
and they give us something that we really need, which is a top veteran defender, which is probably why they wanted Tory Krug for that mindset. And, you know, you look at when we brought in Chris Pronger, who was 34 at the time, that changed the entire outlook of our team. And I'm not saying we're going to get fine at Chris Pronger, but if we can find a top defender, a Ryan Ellis level guy, right, to add on this team, I think that'll give you the stability to go with youth up front and it'll make up for the deficiency down the middle, uh, even if Sean Couturier is not exactly where you need him to be next year. Yeah, I was just going to say, I I think um, the defense makes sense. Like, personally, I think they're going to explore all options. I, mm-hmm. I don't envision a scenario. Yeah, no. yeah, I don't envision a scenario where the team is comfortable saying, hey, you know what? Last season, we played above our heads. We're just going to kind of stay- take a step back. I, I think the opposite like i think they want to build on this year and the goal for next year will be let's make the playoffs yes Uh, we were so close this year we know what it'll take to get in the mix be on the bubble let's push past the bubble and you know get our young guys some real experience in the playoffs um so that's obviously going to be the goal for next season and i think with that being said there won't be a status quo. Um, I think you can't just based on the collapse. I think you cannot say or cannot confidently say, you know, this team being brought back as is can do that. Right. And make the playoffs. I think every team is going to be aiming to getting every team is going to be aiming to get better, especially with the cap going up. So the flyers will have to follow suit if that's their goal, right? They're going to have to make some additions. Um, Who knows where that's going to be. It's going to depend, I think on who's available, the age range, um, but I definitely think the roster will not look the same uh, going yeah. into next season. I think I think so too. And what I think the only exception for the age range is that top defender. That is the one position that you will probably be willing to go with with that age, that older age. Everything else, I can't see them adding a thirty plus year old uh, winger forward. center. Anything yeah, like that that yeah. I can't see happening. But if you can add a defenseman which is about stability and one that is not yeah, who's Mark a top St- pair type guy, right? Exactly. Not Mark Stahl, who at his best was, you know, a top four defender, you know, Johnson was, was like kind of a top pairing back in the day. Like, yeah, you don't want to find a guy at the very end of his career and be saddled with a bad contract, but you can bring a guy who can still play. And, you know, we'll probably have two, three yeah. years here to really expand the defensive's confidence you know, I think that's worth investing in. As far as everything else, the additions will probably be mid mid twenties, early twenties, uh, type of uh, additions and swaps. It'll be interesting to see what happens with um, with Noah Hannafin um, out of but Vegas. That, there, sure, and that that could be an option, right? Yeah. Um, and may, maybe that, and that's the thing is like, you know, to both you and Jason's point is that like. There's going to be money moved. There's going to be teams trying to change the look of their team too. You know, people want to pretend like nobody wants our garbage or anything like that. I I agree to a certain extent, but that's because everybody thinks everything on our team is garbage, and that's not necessarily the case. It just depends on does the trade work for them? What kind of leverage is there yeah. in the trade? What is their cap? State? What other players are they looking for yeah, versus right. what we want? Right? Exactly. Like, and I, the reason I pointed, tango, so the reason I pointed out Vegas is they love big defenders. Like, yeah, so that's why I talked about Risto, right? Who's a big, big body. No, that's fair. Um, totally fair. Who's a little younger yeah, and costs know. less than Petrangelo. So it gives him cap savings. And then maybe they keep Noah Hannafin, right? Um, who's also younger than Petrangelo by about five years, I think. So there's options there. Some If Danny is aggressive and been the way that he's been, I think options will open up. And I do want to bring up Joel Farabee because I'm seeing a lot of hate on Joel Farabee and people talking about like potentially moving him. Look, Vasily and I were both talking about this before. If there's an opportunity where the Flyers, you know, we just brought up the Trevor Zegers thing, Zegers for Faraby, sure, that can be considered. That makes um, sense. Or another young player that, you know, yeah. similar age range, similar potential, fills different needs. Sure, those trades make sense. But Yeah, but I, I do not see Joel Faraby being moved. I, I'll be honest with you guys. Uh, the fact that he's third on the team in points, that he was so good for such a large chunk of the season. I don't think because one of the youngest players on this team is struggling at a very crucial time, not to mention with a bunch of other guys, I don't see how you single out the guy who's been better for you than majority of the rest of your team and go, oh, that's the guy we need to move. Just wait until Tyson Forrester hits a wall at some point. Again, sophomore slumps are very real, and he is definitely susceptible to one, just like everybody else is. Um, I just don't. 
see the the rush to move a guy like Farabee. I think most likely he will be here. Yeah. I think Frost will probably be here. I think Tippett will probably be here. I think all those guys in their mid twenties, they're probably here unless the trade is like, oh, this is makes our team better or this fills a direct need that we, need, we can identify yeah. that we need and if Faraby moves you know i know Bree the chuck is being thrown out there i don't see this as a likely i know we would love to get him but if i have to package joel Faraby to get brady to chuck okay of course, you know yeah. now we're talking like that makes sense to me if it's a if it's a swap with like trevor zegers who's having a down year okay that can make sense to well, me well i'm just seeing things but, like with Faraby, like oh you know we just need to get rid of him he's he can't perform in the crucial times like the f it's crazy just because and I, you know what I think it is. I think it's just the fact that he came into the league at such a young age. Yeah. And it, it always, feels like yes. it feels like he's been around forever, right? Like he came in at 18 and he's 24. So that means he has, you know, s five seasons under his belt right now. Um, you know, so like when you look at it that way, like he's only 24 years old, he's just getting to that prime age where you're going to see, OK, what is this guy going to be, you know, for the remainder of his career? How is he going to be able to produce things like that? And, you know, to get a 50 point season and career high in goals, like he's on the right trend. Right. So to kind of trade him when he's about to hit that threshold of prime age, where he'll likely produce even more. I just think it doesn't make a lot of sense. Unless, like you said, to your point, you're trading him for a, another younger player that's fit, fits a need like a center. Cause you're moving wing for center or packaging him in a bigger deal to get a superstar, which in that case also makes sense sure. because the team is, is becoming a lot better. I, I think what it really is with Faraby is just the fact that he's been around for so long and there's only a handful of guys that have, you know, been on this team that people can point to from past regimes and say, well, oh, look, he wasn't moved. That's the problem. Things like that. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, realistically, like if you look at this team, because I, I think this is a narrative that's been brought up as well, that, oh, you know, the team after this, they just need to fire sale, get rid of everybody. They really need to rebuild and strip it down. Like, you know, there's looking only at it already. Yeah, like they've moved on from everybody. There's only five guys left um, on this team that were on the roster three years ago. And those guys are Couturier, Lawton, Konechny, Sanheim, Faraby. And Faraby, you know, is the young guy of that group, right? Like he was essentially a rookie a couple of seasons ago. Um, so I think for the Faraby stuff, it's just the fact he's been around forever. But he hasn't even hit his prime yet. He's really just still yeah. a young a young player. So Yeah, no, I, I think it's really well said. And I think people shouldn't underestimate what pain and suffering does to development. And, you know, this I love... This is going to leave a sour taste. Yeah, I, well, I love the quote, you know, uh, character like a photograph is developed in darkness. And, you know, I don't think people should underestimate the lessons being learned here. It might be painful if you watch. What do you think happens with a rebuild? You know, how much losing do you guys think that they would incur if you remove a bunch of the veterans off this team and watch them decline into the bottom team? You guys think like San Jose is going to get, you know, Celebrini and then just turn their season around? Look you at know, Chicago with Bedard. Yeah, it's that's not going to happen. It's well, it's take, hockey. It's not basketball. So Right. So like, yeah, the timelines and all that matter. But right now we have a bunch of guys around the same age. And some of these guys, I know this is killing everybody. How do you think Tampa Bay felt when they got swept by John Tortorella in the first round when they were by far the best team in the league? You know, like everyone, right? Pain and suffering can be leveraged for success. And I know that sucks to hear because it does suck to experience what we've experienced. I don't blame anybody for being upset. You know, you absolutely should be upset. We you both can, were. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We're, I mean, I was dying inside watching that game. But at the same time, do not underestimate what it can do to push you forward. Um, and I, I think the the biggest thing that I would look to fix, and look, that might require changing a coach, but this power play, I do not buy these excuses that the Flyers' power play has been bad. It has gotten worse under Rocky Thompson. I'm sorry. I'm not saying he's yeah. a bad coach. I'm not saying he should be fired. I don't know. I'm not behind the scenes. It's hard for me to blame one guy you know, on all of the team's problems. I'm not that guy. But there's no way that there is such little amount of talent. The execution of the power play has been bad. Players are not being put in the right positions. I don't like outsmarting my coaches. That annoys the shit out of me. And I'm not saying he doesn't know what he's talking about. That's nonsense. He knows more about hockey than I probably will ever know in my life. 
but there something has to be done about the power play. This team, let's just say this straight up. If Carter Hart wasn't removed for this team and the Flyers had an even tw- number 20 power play, They'd they are the easily firmly. in the playoffs. Firmly, like Vasily just said, firmly in the playoffs. So it shows you how much that killed us all year to not yeah. have an even close to adequate power play. Well, ahead, we always Steve. say how important special teams are. If you look at all the teams in the playoffs, chances are their special teams are probably in the top half, top 15 of the league. It's typically the case. Yeah. And the Flyers penalty kill was really good all season. It was fantastic. Um, and it was the best in the league at one point. Yeah. Over this last month, what have we seen, right? The penalty kill has dwindled and their power plays remain shit. And when you have no balance. Yeah. When you have a really bad penalty kill and a really bad power play, you know, you spend a lot of team or a lot of time in the NHL on special teams. And if your special teams are terrible at both ends, think about how that affects the team on five on five play that carries into that and it negatively affects them. The um, momentum I think that, that you yeah, lose. the moment. That's what I mean, right? I think that also is a factor of, of kind of what we've seen over this last month here and this Four kind of minute collapse. power play, get Can't nothing score. from it. Exactly. Then what do you think the team thinks? Well, we can't score a man up. We're going to score now five on five. Like, trust me, things like that go through the players' minds, right? They get frustrated. Um, it's just human nature when things like that happen. Uh, but yeah, I can't believe things to fix. I forgot to mention the power play because we've been harping on it all season. But I think that goes back to kind of like, you know, adding some sort of player that can really either quarterback the power play maybe that's drysdale like he has that skill set maybe that's something they could develop and have come out of him but to your point you're even you know you add that big time defenseman he helps out on that power play to run it as the quarterback kind of can maybe help drysdale get into that role uh moving play, forward you don't have to play sandheim and york 28 minutes a night you know yeah that too and also like i said too right add that you know big time type of center. I'm sure that's going to help on the power play as well. If that's something you can pull when, off um, when this so. team was playing their best, I'm sorry to cut you off, but when this team was playing their best, Sanheim and York were playing 22 minutes a night. Walker was playing about 21 minutes, 20 a night. minutes sealer as well. 20 minutes. Sealer was playing close to 20 minutes. Uh, Ristolainen was healthy and they got to be able like to spread the minutes. minutes around here. Yes, and that completely collapsed. And when this team does not play well defensively, and I've been saying it all year, they're like they're like yeah, they win on the transition, but they don't win run and gun hockey. You know that's not their strength is running gun. They don't have the guns, and if they do, they're too young. Well, to the even transition. Do that. You're even to your point. The transition for the Flyers, it's not more. It's not run and gun more so that it is like um, catch them. quick strike quick strike in transition. Like they Perfect. make a mistake Perfect and then we quick strike and kind of score. And then the flyers are solid defensively. It's hard for a team to get back into it yes. after they make that mistake. Yes. And that's where the flyers would typically grab that momentum throughout the season. And then, you know, cruise to a lot of their and, wins. And they did not play this way over this recent stretch, like at yeah. all. Like you saw it degrading over. I mean, they did in the gauntlet games. That's the thing. It's yeah. like, it's so crazy. You know, they weren't rewarded that much during this, the gauntlet. But they played some really great hockey then and then and then collapsed against the worst teams in the league, you know, and it's easy to freak out about that. But it's also important to remember that it's not 15 games that the team has been playing horribly. You no, know, it's, it's really the games. stretch of six games that they've yeah. been playing horribly. And for whatever reason, you know, and you guys can try to say you lost the room. I don't believe it. I don't believe Torts lost the room. And, and I understand the evidence for it. You know, a 9-3 loss. A six-one loss, a four-one loss. Yeah, I, I, if that's mid-season, fine. But at the finish line, I don't know. It's a little harder for me. And after they changed their culture so much and all that, and that, and I just that goes, think a lot of frustration. Uh, yeah, of what it is. I think you nailed honest. it. What you said. I think what you said nailed it. But what you said earlier, and um, I think it's the and like what I was saying. It's like the lack of concentration. Like you see it. You see it. It's stupid. Well, Please. You, you get frustrated. You're not scoring. You try certain things you might not always try, right? Because you're yeah. thinking to yourself, nothing's working. Like, let's try this instead, right? Let's throw it all at the dartboard, see what happens. Yeah. Which really, they should have been going back to their structure, their system. That's what should have been happening. Hey, you know what? It's not working. But look what look at what what the system has done for us all like year. The way they played Florida. Yeah, exactly. But I think the team needed to kind of regroup and say, hey, like. 
it's not working right now. What the coaches are telling us, you know, the system isn't working, but this whole season it's paid off. So we need to get back to that. I think the team went the opposite direction. They kind of panicked, yeah, frustrated. And instead of, you know, sticking to their guns, sticking to their system, they're kind of all over the place in terms of their structure and not really in sync. And that's their downfall, unfortunately. Yeah. And so let's talk about the draft a little bit. So the Flyers draft position is obviously changing. We don't know where they're going to end up finishing. I think again, could they have be three, 10. could be anywhere from 10 to 16 at this point. We don't really if, know if they lose out here essentially and Buffalo um, and New Jersey surpass them. Um, they should be 11 cracking, cracking if, too. Yeah, right. Seattle. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah. So if Buffalo, New Jersey surpassed them 11th, if the Kraken could somehow also surpass them, would be 10th. So I'd imagine they're probably going to finish anywhere, like you said, between 10 I, to 13 or 14. I'll be honest. I wouldn't be surprised if they beat the Rangers in the next game, um, which would, would be, be super funny uh, <laughs> to go from a 9 3 loss to a not great opponent to beating the arguably the top team in the NHL. Um, but so I, I don't expect them to lose out completely, but maybe they'll lose two or at least one more of these games. It could happen again. If they continue playing what they, the way they've been playing, it'll, it'll happen. It'll be, it is what it is. The benefit of that is, you know, there are guys like a Gil, a Ginla, uh, Bayum. Um, there are a bunch of guys in that. Sasha Boyver. Boy yeah. Really good yeah. There's a lot of guys in that area. And I was thinking about this because, it's one of those hockey gods thing that I said last year where the Flyers ended up finishing at seven and everybody's like, oh, they're never going to get the guy that they want at seven. And they ended up getting a potential generational talent, Matt, Matt Faye Mitchkov. The hockey gods will smile upon you if you do the right thing, in my opinion. I think you try to either finish strong or let things fall as they may, and the right player will come to you and draft well. And I think with the fact that Florida has been struggling as well, that gives us about a tw- the number 25 pick most likely unless they make it really far into the playoffs you know but the flyers will have these two picks plus potentially a high second round pick with uh Columbus and then there and then another second round pick it's actually a pretty good place to be in going into the draft so i i think the draft i think they probably will end up making both picks um unless they want to package and and move up a, a few spots we never see that happen um, so I do think that they're going to end up taking both of those picks. Maybe they trade a second, uh, assuming they have an extra one. Um, if they don't, I think they'll end up just drafting in the second round, but, um, I think this draft is going to be huge. And obviously we'll have, we mentioned it already. We'll have Steve back on and we'll do a pre-draft show and a post-draft show with him. Um, so you guys will have all the details about the draft kind of leading up, especially when we know at least where we're, where we're drafting, and we, I assume we'll probably do it right around the uh, lottery draft, like right after the lottery draft, we'll have Steve on or something like that. Yeah, that would be good. And you can kind of break down like latest rankings. Um, Cause I think the junior playoffs will be close to wrapping up then too. So he'll be watching those and good, good point. Um, so the other thing we should probably bring up, um, we are coming close to the end of the show, but uh, the Flyers did actually make a signing for Oscar Eklund, um, a player over from the SHL. He's 25 years old. He's six, four, um, he kind of had a large jump in production. Uh, he, I believe he's leading his team in goals. If I remember correctly. Um, I don't know exactly what to make of him. I know Alexander Appleyard seems to be tenuously high on him, but also labeled him as a fourth line player. But, you know, we we're talking about how we do need size, um, and physicality. He does seem like that type of guy. I don't know if he's even going to play for the flyers next year. He might be just an AHL type of guy. Um, you know, Colin Wilson's, uh, not Colin Wilson. Is it Colin Wilson? Who's the captain of the Phantoms? Why is this escaping me? Um, I don't know. I gotta oh, look it up right escaping, now. It's escaping me too. Uh, uh, Garrett Wilson. Garrett Wilson. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah. So, yeah, Garrett. Wow. I don't know where my head went. Yeah, on. same Colin last Wilson, name. That's okay. You, yeah, Wilson. Colin Wilson used to play in the NHL. Um, you know, this could be a replacement for him. He's kind of getting up there in age, but you know. Uh, another interesting signing. Don't know what to make of it, but uh, he could be a defense. Like typically, when a guy is a high end scorer in the SHL in his mid twenties, it's not really a sign that he's going to be a scorer in the NHL. But a lot of times, if they're good defensively and they're good at you know um, the other elements of the game, that's why the Flyers will bring somebody over. Pierre Edouard Belmar, somebody you can think of who was a scorer in the French league came over here and was just a pure defensive center and a damn good one at that. 
Um, but he is a player I think that uh, that could come yeah. into play next year. That's one guy. Like for example, one success story or success stories PEB for the Flyers. Then you have another guy that was a long time ago. I don't know if people remember him, but Mika Piorala uh, was back during the Richards Carter era where they brought him over. He was a scorer in the SHL and didn't turn out. So it can go either way with these guys. Kind of like Yuri was saying, there's really no telling how it's going to work with Eklund, but. Um, at least from you know production standpoint, 48 games this year in the uh, SHL. Uh, he had a 17 goals, 11 assists for 28 points. So not even really a point-a-game guy at the SHL level. So I don't know if he's going to be a guy that really tears it up from a productive stand or production standpoint in the NHL, but could be a guy that you know you play like uh, on a fourth line or in the bottom six, kind of like um, Alex Appleyard was referring to uh, when he kind of tweeted his analysis out about him. But he is a big guy, right? Like six three. 190 pounds. So for a team that is on the smaller side, um, I think maybe that's something they are looking for, right? Like Jason was referring to might yeah. not be in the top six, but try to add some size if possible, but it's really just a low risk, high reward type move. Worst case plays for the phantoms. Best case you found an NHL player overseas um, in the SHL. And maybe he's the guy who plays with paling and Hathaway next year. Like yeah. I think Delorier's role is going to be primarily a 13th forward on this team moving forward until play him when, yeah, play him when the other team has a fighter in basically. Yeah. And I think he'll probably be relegated to most likely um, the position of waiting till his contract is close near to expiration and probably moving on from him early. Cause somebody will look for his services as that type of player. We saw it happen with Ryan Reeves. And if he's on a one year deal, um, at that point or even a two-year deal I think it uh, makes it a lot more appetizing for a team so we'll see I, I think there's a lot of roster adjustment that's going to happen again I still think a guy like Scott Lawton could get moved I think other guys could get moved I think Cam Atkinson Flyers will hope that he can get his game back but he's definitely going to be moved next year either at the trade deadline or prior if they can Ryan Johansson is still part of this organization they need to move on from his cap space yeah. um, maybe eat two million of that Again, I expect a little bit more of this like cat eating nonsense to last for at least another season. Um, and then they'll probably as um Hayes is on that last year of that uh that retention, I think they're gonna stop start moving off of that uh in about two years um or two seasons. I think yeah. you're gonna you're gonna stop seeing that kind of stuff. So um, but I think Danny Breer has shown that he can be very creative. So um, you know. Let's give him a chance. I'm, I'm excited yeah, think, for the offseason regardless. No, I'm excited for the offseason despite obviously the uh, terrible end to this season. It's not great. Not what we were hoping for. You want to see these guys, you know, get that real taste of the playoffs. Though it is good they experience these games. They are meaningful despite the fact they collapse during them. Um, it's yeah. like Jason said, like you said, you know, it's still a learning experience. This is going to be leaving a real sour taste in the mouths of the guys who are going to be here next year. So I'd imagine they're going to be pretty motivated to, you know, follow up and at least try to make the playoffs. Um, but yeah, like Briere shown time and time again for me so far that he's willing to explore all avenues to make the team better. So I don't think anything is off the table. Like if it, if it makes sense to him and the brass that they evaluate and think, hey, we make this move, it's going to make us a better team. I have no doubts that he will pursue it and, and make the deal. So I think yeah. that's that's a refreshing thing, changing over right from the prior regime and the way that GM operated to kind of what Briere um, is doing and the way he's going to handle this organization going ahead. Yeah, to totally. So a uh, quick Phantoms update. They lost a couple games in a row, kind of brutally. Um, they are similar. Still yeah, um, I still don't know what's going to happen with Lappy. I'm still a little confused if they hold on to him or not. Um, we'll see. There's been no talk of that at all. Are um, they still in a playoff spot, you read the fans? I think they're exactly where they were. Um, kind just of middling, on. just barely hanging on to a playoff spot. We'll see. Still, they still have a handful of games left. They got to win them. Um, but I hope they do make the playoffs. It's good experience for all those guys, too. And uh, also should mention that uh, the the Reading Royals made an interesting signing. Um, former, I think it was sixth round pick, sixth or seventh, I can't remember. Seventh round. Seventh round. Uh, Mateo Mann, uh, the, the humongous defender, uh, signed an ATO, which I was thought was kind of weird for the Reading Royals. It looks like they probably don't project him to be anything. Um, so, you know, they maybe want to see if he can work his way up through the ECHL. 
Um, he'll be a really good defender in the ECHL level, but I don't know if he'll uh, yeah really be a part of the Phantoms. Uh, he's a big soon. guy. Like he, he's a big dude. He's six six, two twenty seven, and he's only nineteen, so he's gonna add some more weight. Um, yeah. I think for him, like you said, like it'll just be can he work his way up from you know the ECHL eventually to the AHL and then moving ahead. Um, he's going to be a big project for them, right? So yeah. I wouldn't expect yeah. I wouldn't expect much at this point, but you really never know where it's going to go. Sometimes these stay at home, big, really big defensemen. Sometimes they can, you know, put the work in and ends up being a bottom pair guy eventually, like a Jamie Alexiak, right? Like who knows? Yeah, I think that's why they took the risk on him, right? Same reason why they went with Fedotov, who was uh, six seven at the time they drafted him, now six eight. Um, you know. You you go with a guy who's something that can't be taught, which is your size, um, yeah. and hope that you can put the other stuff together. Um, and the Flyers have done well on late picks, so even if the guy ends up being an AHL player, I don't think it's a it's terrible a win pick. As a seventh a, round yeah, rounder. seventh round pick. I don't think it's a it's an issue. Um, but there's just other guys ahead of him, like Ethan Sanson is obviously way ahead uh, up on the depth chart over uh, Mateo Man, and that guy needs to be developed. And there's Helgi Granz, who you know didn't have a great season in the AHL this year. Um, they're still working with him. So, and I, you know, one thing I love that Jason said is that like how in love people are with draft picks. Um, I definitely think he's absolutely right. I think unless it's like a top pick, um, and even then it's a risk. It's like, you're not necessarily getting something better just because it's a young guy. Um, and that's again, why I go with shoring up the defense. Like I was saying earlier, I think is as important as anything, because then you can, make mistakes you know you can put in a younger goalie you can put in a younger forward right because he's got a better defense behind him and i think when jonesy said that they were going to build from the defense out you know from the back out i think this is a lot to do with that it's shoring up that defense and they're undersized like their d is not big enough um just like their wings aren't big enough so these are the things that they will have to adjust and I think there's room for adjustment. And I think the Flyers have a numbers game problem on forward anyway. Um, so they might move on from somebody that maybe we don't expect uh, just for the sheer fact that they, you know, have an abundance of it. Um, I think some wingers to your point, right? Yeah. Like their wing depth. I mean, they have a lot of wingers, especially on the right side. So yeah. I, I think we could see some sort of trade there. Do, do you, with Konechny being rumored to be getting signed an extension, has your opinion of keeping him changed? Uh, I think they should keep him. I think if it's anything, though, more than uh, $9 million, that's a big ticket um, to pay. So personally, I wouldn't pay more than $9 million for him. I think that's a fair fair price for what he brings sure. you. Um, the one factor you have to take into consideration for me with him is past two seasons, he's been injured both seasons. So that's something you can use in your negotiating to maybe bring that cap hit down. Um, the only concerning thing for me with him is he didn't produce over this crucial stretch. So has the majority of the team. Last time this team was in the playoffs, didn't score any goals either. Those are two factors I look at and say, hey, like those are concerning. You can't ignore those. Those these are the biggest stretches for the team recently. You know that playoff series against Montreal and the Islanders in the bubble, and then this stretch here has been their closest to getting back to the playoffs since that point, and and no production. Those are two things you have to look at. But I just think that um, you know he's a guy that's really intense, really competitive. I just think in terms of you know the the lack of production in those areas, it's probably a coincidence, and the fact that the team wasn't really producing all that well offensively, you know, in the bubble and over this period of time. Personally, I think, you know, Konechny, uh would benefit, um, you know, from playing with probably better skilled offensive players. Like he's played with some good players, but I, I do think, you know, he would benefit maybe for playing with a guy that is a bona fide first line center. Not to say Sean Couture is not, but I, I just think offensively, um, he might not be as good as he once was earlier in his career. Like he's going to be more of that defensive shutdown guy for you going forward. Um, so I think, you know, if you get him with a, a high end scoring center, he's going to produce even more for you. Um, I, I think, I think they'll keep him, but 
there's some things you you have to take into consideration, and I wouldn't pay more than nine million to keep him either. I don't even think it'll take nine million. I think I think the fact that the power play was doing so poorly, I think you have plenty of leverage to keep him down. I think eight million is definitely possible. Um, Fair deal. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I think you 100% keep TK unless there's a deal out there that we're not aware of that's like hey, a must jump, but I don't think it's for a draft pick. I know most people will think that that's what it is. I I don't think that that's what the Flyers would even be looking for for TK. Um, so I think overall, I think you keep TK. I think there are other players you much rather move, like uh, Scott Lawton. You know, you want to free up space. I, again, I really like Lawton. I don't think they're jumping to get rid of him. But if you want to free up some cap space and get some some assets back to yeah. make other trades, that's the guy oh, you you do that with. I I think you're hundred percent right. I, I just think it's asinine to trade, you know, one of your only players that could consistently score goals, even though in some crucial stretches. Yeah. Even though in some crucial stretches, he hasn't been able to, but like he's still developing and kind of getting used to playing in these crucial times. So that's a thing you have to take into consideration too, that, Hey, like, you know, I'm sure he's frustrated. He's not producing, but this might motivate him and, you know, get him to that next level in these crucial points next time around. But yeah, to trade, you know, a guy that is one of your only consistent scorers and remove him from a team that everybody thinks needs to add more scoring. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I don't, again, I see no evidence that this team is tanking. I see evidence of iterating. So yeah. why would you remove a guy who's 26 years old and is your leading goal scorer and point getter on the team? You need to add and give him more Especially help. Especially when he wants to be here, he will attract other outside talent and you can probably get him lower than what you guys imagine in your head. I see the worst case scenario, but all of a sudden I'm seeing 9 million a year for connecting at eight years. It's like, maybe, maybe it's 9 million at six years. Yeah. You know, I, I or, just or think eight for eight. Right. I like, think you need to supplement the talent and help him. Um, if you subtract him, you're just going to be looking to add, you know, I still think he has another similar gear. player. I, I think he can be even better than what he was. I, I think, I think he, he can be a 40 goal guy, but he just needs to stay healthy um, at this point. There's two back to back years I, where he's got gotten hurt. So, yeah, I look, I agree with that, but I think he can be even better. Like, I think he's a 40 goal guy now if you give him an elite. Uh, yeah, if he stays, even how, if, yeah. if he played those whole season this year, he would have scored 40 goals, right? Yeah. So I think he has a gear above that. I think he is a Marchand type of player, not a Gallagher type of player. I think he's better than Gallagher. I think he's Marchand level caliber player. And I think that's the type of guy you hold on to for a long time. And I think the Flyers will. And I think we will look back at it as a wise signing. And you look at him and Tippett and Far and Forrester and Farabee. And then Mitch Kov, I think your top nine will be set. A guy like Brink is still trying to be defined as in his role. But outside of that, there really isn't wingers, right? Like those are the, your your definites of guys that you know can contribute at a high clip for you at the NHL level. Those are the ones you can pencil in. And then everything else, you know, like Frost has done an adequate job. Paling is an adequate has done an adequate job, but him and Lawton are a bit redundant to some degree. Um you know, that's where I think, you know, you're not you're not you're not going to really try to remove from your top six. You're going to try to maybe push some guys down like you were saying um, and then maybe have a, a top center at one point. Let Mitch Cobb take over top wing and have Konechny be the second line or playing with Mitch Cobb. We don't really know what's going to happen at that point. Like and again, we don't know what's going to happen with Forrester. We don't know what's going to happen with Tippett. All these guys will continue to get better. I know everybody thinks it's the end of the world right now. Stay focused on the task at hand. I promise you that the ownership is, and they're not thinking like people on Twitter. And if you're one of the people who are thinking that way, you're actually a lot more alone in your thought process than you think you are. Like, I know people were raging and freaking out online and mocking the ownership all or the, the GM the thought process and all at this point. I think you are misguided. I think you're emotional. And I think you got to take your emotion out of this stuff and learn to deal with this stuff and i get why it pisses it pissed me the hell off too i didn't i was telling facility i didn't even want to really go on a podcast today and talk about the flyers it's not that exciting but i know where my mindset is and again take it from two guys who did tell you where this team would be which is at the border for a playoff team and that was when we had carter hart 
when we thought Couturier was going to play playing well. Like without those elements, you know, it's kind of a different team, and yet they still finished in that point. They absolutely belong here. You know, people we say they were playing over their head, but they really are not. They're playing exactly where they are. They're it's a bubble a, team, yeah. We yeah, said it all season, right? When exactly. they're healthy, they're a bubble team. So we didn't get that wrong. They, by, or they right need by to accident. add. Well, they need to add at this point to become more than that, and I yes, think that's what the team is yes. going to try to do. So a bubble team is not good enough. We we are aware of that. Nobody said that it is, and nobody but there's said steps. That you can't just you can't just go from a bottom of the league team that they were to a contender. You know, in a season, it's going to take time. Like this is a rebuild, as the organization has said. Um, and there's steps to rebuilding and steps to getting to that point. And I think this is the first step that the team need to take, get close to have a taste of, of what it's like to be meaningful games and then move, move forward and try to inch at it year by year. And then hopefully once you have Mitch come over, you've added even more talent to your yes. roster to really truly contend. So, and, and at that point, if you look at Mitch timeline, the dead cap space of Peterson, uh, hopefully Hayes, right? That'll be on the last year. We'll be done with those buyouts and the, or yeah. the retentions. That will be out. The cap will have gone up significantly by then. That is your window. We brought it up over and over again. It is an iterative process until you get to the window that should be open at that point. And Farabee's value is not going to drop, right? If they have to move Farabee in a year or two, fine, so be it. But it's not going to drop. Over the next, especially not after this year. That's completely fabricated by people online. Most teams would be like, yeah, we'll add a 50-point guy who's 24 on a team that couldn't score on the power play to save their lives. You know, imagine what this team would have put up production-wise if they had even a somewhat adequate power play. And that goes for Frost, too. And I, I'm not saying they need to move Frost, but that goes for anybody on this team. If and that's why I think it's so crucial they fix this power play because it makes the trade value of all of your players go up because their stats are better. And that's what a lot of these guys will look at when they go, okay, he can help us not just on five on five, but on the power play too. Or they can help us on the penalty kill, which is why Lawton is so valuable, is that he helps in all situations. All right, let's call it at this one. Um, anything else you want to add? No, just uh, we're going to continue to record um, and have Flyers content even uh, as the season you know ends uh, into the off season. Uh, we're one of the only Flyers podcasts that will record through the summer and the off season. Uh, so stay tuned. Like we're going to keep talking about the team and really gear up and get uh, ready for the draft here. So yeah, I can't wait for that dead time of year after free agency where nothing happens. And we still got to talk about it. Yeah, my favorite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, again, thank you everybody for listening. Um, just want to remind everybody, please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell for notifications, follow us on iTunes and Spotify, give us a rating there as well. Again, if you guys could do that, that helps us tremendously, um, especially with more ratings on iTunes. Please, if you're listening an audio version, if you're on iTunes, uh, give us a rating that is uh, give us five star, please. That would be amazing. You don't have to, obviously, but um, all of that is tremendously helpful for us. Uh, and again, a shout out to our sponsor, Jim Stakes on Fourth and South. They will be open reopening May first um, after being out from a fire for a very long time, and then also uh, public summit adjusters at two one five seven five two zero five six zero. Again, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Vasily. We love you guys. And remember, always stay. Safe.